There, oh, there it is. Did y'all hear the prayer? Should I do it again? It was, <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hey, I want to say thank you for praying for my wife, Terry. She's doing better. She's out of the hospital, and uh, she's, she's resting right now. She wanted to come today, and uh, doctor's orders, and I was the doctor. I said, why don't you just stay, stay home? She's with my mom, best mom in all the world, resting, eating chicken soup, all that cool kind of stuff. She's actually at Bedside Baptist, the Church of the Inner Springs. That's where she's at, worshiping today. I want to say congrats to all you dads. God said, fill the earth, and we said, we'll do the best we can. Amen? Is that right? So uh, God bless you, and thank you for being here today. We honor you and the call that each one of us has as fathers to reflect our father to our children and our grandchildren. Today in our passage, we're reading about something that's very, very appropriate for Father's Day. I mean, if we could have just thought about a better passage to preach on Father's Day, I can't think of a better one, and it's on fasting, all right? It's on fasting, fortunes, and following Jesus. After prayer, Jesus specifically taught us to pray, right? Last week's message. This week's message is a continuation of prayer. How do I know that? Because Jesus says, and. The very first verse, the very first word in verse 16 is and. It's a conjunction. He talks about prayer, you know, lead us not to temptation, deliver us from evil, that's the prayer, and when you fast. So prayer and fasting are right in line with each other. Would you not agree? There's a lot spoken of about fasting, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus doesn't necessarily give the the how to fast here, but he gives the why. He kind of gives the what of fasting. So we'll read it. When you fast... And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the what? Hypocrites. You guys have your Bibles? Open them up, please, if you have them. You have to take my word for it if you don't. For they disfigure their faces that that their fasting might be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will do what? He will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy, where thieves break in the steel, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where the thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the, dar- the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will love the one, and, excuse me, hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Quite apropos for each one of us today, no matter what the day. Fasting, by the way, has nothing to do with fast food. It has nothing to do with eating fast. You know, I'm fasting, so I'm going to go get that triple burrito at the border, all right? Only a dollar and a quarter. I'm fasting. Fasting is doing without food. Fasting sometimes is doing without other things as well. It might be I'm fasting from the computer. I'm fasting from my phone. Hallelujah! Anybody want to just take the phone and give it a pitch? Fasting has a spiritual focus in the Bible. In fact, we find in the Old Testament, Nehemiah fasted. It wasn't necessarily that God called him to fast. It's just he was so overcome with the condition of the children of Israel in Jerusalem with the walls broken down, he couldn't eat. He fasted. It focused his attention on God. Why is it important to fast? And by the way, do believers, are believers called to fast today? Yes, absolutely. In fact, Jesus didn't say, if you pray, or excuse me, if you fast, or if you, you know, maybe you want to make it. He says, when you fast. It's understood that Christians, followers of Jesus, will fast. And when we do, it's for a spiritual focus. Jesus did it in Matthew chapter 4. He left us a legacy, a testimony. When he went into the desert and he was tempted by the devil, right? 
He fasted 40 days, 40 nights he fasted and focused his attention on his father. One of the reasons why fasting, I mean, excuse me, food really consumes our attention. I mean, I read an article this week, it said that we think about food four times as much as we think about what we're working on. You guys, you're going to work, what do you think about? You think about lunch, right? When's my next break? I got a break at 10, I got coffee, coffee and donuts, sweet. You know, I'll see if I can get this project done. Why? Because we think about food four times as much as we think about work. So food has a lot to do with the consummation of our attention. And so when we say, I'm not going to eat food, I'm going to focus on God, that's exactly what it's for. It's for spiritual focus. And there is a time when we fast, there's a time when we don't fast. We don't set up this religious ritual and say, well, we fast every fourth Sunday of the month. That's exactly what Jesus said, don't do. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were called to fast one day a year. I think it's Leviticus, I believe it's Leviticus 16, I think it is, where God calls the nation of Israel to set apart, set themselves apart to fast. But there were times when they fasted, when they were overwhelmed with trouble, difficulties, and they fasted. In fact, Jesus was confronted by people. Matthew chapter 9, when when individuals came and they said, how come you don't fast? How come your disciples don't fast? How come you're, like, like, the, like the Pharisees, we fast, but the followers of, of John the Baptist, they fast, but your disciples don't fast. How come they don't fast? I guess they're not as spiritual as we are. Jesus said, hey, they don't need to fast. You don't fast when the groom is president in the wedding. How you think about it. You go to a wedding, hey, congratulations. Would you like a piece of cake? No, I'm fasting. Yeah. Did you see the sign? Fasting. Jesus said, you don't need to do that. When the groom is present, there's going to be a time when my disciples will will fast. That's when the groom is gone. He's speaking about the cross. They'll fast. In fact, in Acts chapter 13 and 14, the church in Antioch, they fasted. Why? Because they wanted to hear from God as to what they should do in relationship to whether they should send Paul and Barnabas out to the world to preach the gospel. And they fasted, and the Holy Spirit said, send them out. So it's a time for spiritual focus. And God calls us to fast. There are times when we will fast. In fact, I think in the fall this year, our leadership's going to spend a day of fasting and prayer for God's direction for the body for the next number of months, right? What does God want us to do? So fasting is to be done by God's people. But first and foremost, verse 16, Jesus laid down some parameters. Number one, it is not done to please people. That's what religious people do. Am I I not right? Religious people do it like a performance. I mean, Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6. When you give, don't sound a trumpet. I'm giving. So everybody can see what you're giving. When you do good deeds, don't say, hey, look what I'm doing. No, you don't do it to please people. You do it to please who? God. That's what Jesus says, verse 16. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. What's wrong? Oh, I'm fasting. (laughs) It's so hard. Jesus says, you do that, you've already got your reward. People are like, man, you're so righteous. Wow. I wish I could hold off on the Big Macs for at least a day. Wash your face. Groom yourself. I'll never forget in Bible college. By the way, Bible college is not filled with perfect people, right? Any of you guys go to Bible college? Say amen somebody. A lot of young people who are striving to know what God wants them to do, but it's not a perfect place. In fact, there was one, (laughs) one guy, I came into lunch, and he was standing there. And he looked like he'd been hit by a truck or something. I mean, his hair was all greasy, stringy looking, hadn't shaved. I said, are you getting in line? Are you going to have something to eat? He goes, no, I'm fasting. I said, well, what's going on? How come you're not, you you didn't wash your hair? It looks like you've just been, are you depressed? Are you discouraged? What's going on? He goes, no, I just didn't want to draw any attention to myself. I said, well, you're not only drawing attention to yourself, you're drawing flies right now, all right? So please go back to Matthew chapter 6 and read what it says about fasting. I told him this. 
I, it was all in love. I, I guarantee you it was very in love. I, I know this guy. I know. So it's like, boom, here it is. And I said, look, are you fast? It's not about pleasing people or making some big impression on people. You're called to seek after God. Go back, shower, clean yourself up so nobody else has to ask you what's going on. It's wrong, right? That's what Jesus said. He says, if you do that, you've received your reward. What's the reward? The pleasure of others. Wow. Man, that guy, he's such a spiritual guy. Wow. I wonder if he's married. Be a good husband. What's fasting to be done? Why is it to be done? Point number two, it's done to please, to seek after who? That was pretty weak. Let's say it again. It's done to seek after God. Right. Look at verse 17 and 18. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your what? Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. How does it reward us? Well, there are times where God rewards us with clarity of thought, clarity of thinking, clarity of goals, clarity of purpose. He answers prayer. He specifically speaks to us through his word, right? But God also speaks to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit speaks to me must with the word of God, what? Agree. So fasting is a time to quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, quiet our spirits, quiet our stomachs, and seek after God. And when those pangs of hunger come, that's like the initiative, the springboard to say, I'm going to go to God and I'm going to go to him in prayer. That's what fasting is about. It's, just, it's about seeking after God. Jesus says, when you pray, pray this way. Start off with praise. Start off, the, and then as you continue in praise, ask God to provide for you, and then ask God to protect you. And when you fast, because prayer and fasting are seen in Scripture as really cohesively united. You'll never forget the time, or I won't forget the time, Matthew chapter 9, or Mark chapter 9, Jesus comes down from the mountain of transfiguration. Remember, there's a little guy who's, who's possessed by a demon. Do you remember that? And the disciples who didn't go with Jesus, transfiguration, they're, they're trying to cast the demon out, and what does Jesus say? This spirit will not come out but by prayer and fasting. So fasting is a time to seek after God. Has God called us to fast? He might call you to fast personally in relationship to a need in your family or your life. And you say, God, I need to set aside time to seek after you. When you do it, don't put the shirt on. I'm fasting. Be kind to me. You know, that type of stuff. Do it in secret. And your father who sees in secret will, he'll reward you in some way. I, I can't tell you what the reward may be, but it, he does promise to reward us, right? He promises perhaps to answer something that we're seeking clarification on, or maybe an answer to prayer. So fasting is for spiritual focus. Number two, Jesus talks about another thing that consumes our thoughts. Not only does food consume our thoughts, but money also consume our, consumes our thoughts. And so we go to point number two about building, uh, building a fortune that will last forever. Jesus speaks about money in verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But do what? Lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And this is that great verse that we often quote, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be, what? Also. You guys think about money a lot? Be honest. We think about it all the time. There's too much month, there's not enough money. If I could only be making more money, if I could be work, working more hours, how are we going to pay this bill? How are we not going to pay this bill? My wife's been in the hospital. How am I going to pay for it, right? We think about money all the time. You know that Jesus spoke a lot about money. Some people come into church and go, oh, gee, you know, here it is. Haven't been to church in four weeks. I come back. What does he talk about? Talk about money. Well, the reason why I'm talking about money is because Jesus talks about money. 
And he talked about it more than heaven, and he talked about it more than hell. Why is that? Because money consumes us. Causes us to worry. It brings anxiety into our lives. How am I going to take care of that house payment? How am I going to take care of my kids going to college? I got to sell my firstborn to send my lastborn to college? What do I do? You guys who have student debt, I mean, my heart goes out to you. Some people graduate from college, they got 100 grand in student debt, and they go to work as teachers. How are you going to do that? Money takes up a lot of our attention, and Jesus knows it. And he says, I want you to do something that few other people know how to do. I want you to build up a treasure that will last forever. Can I have a sign-up list for that one? A sign-up list so you can invest in something that your ROI, your return on investment, will never go down. It will, con it will continue to escalate. And I'm not talking about buying silver this morning, all right? Hear those commercials? Buy gold, buy silver, buy real estate. Jesus says, do what God wants you to do with your money, and it will return for you an investment that will impact the lives of millions of people and will last forever. How's that? In fact, when God calls us to give to him, listen, this is something that we often have a mental block especially when pastors are talking about it. When God calls us to give something to him, he's not, he does not want to take anything from us. Think about that. So, oh, yes, he does. He wants a tenth. Do you know that God's invitation to give is not an invitation to take anything from you, but to give you an opportunity to experience something you'll never be able to experience any other way. And that is to receive from God. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Oh, you can believe it because the word of God tells us, right? Heaven and earth will pass away. My word will not pass away. Whatever Jesus says, I believe it. Anybody else? Jesus said, look, you can invest in the things of this world and they will decay. That's point number one. Earthly fortunes don't last. It's a picture of that, by the way, it's not the government, all right? Taking that wallet out of your pocket, but sometimes you feel like it is. Fortunes here will decay. Jesus told us the moths break in, they eat the clothing, they destroy the treasures. Thieves can break in and steal. That's what happens with earthly investments. Not all of them. I mean, Jesus is not telling us to be poor planners. We need to plan, right? We need to plan for our retirement. However, I really don't know if I'm going to make retirement, but I want to make sure the people in my family are okay. Amen? Amen. I don't want to be a fool with the things that God has given me. So God says, look, don't be a fool. Invest, but realize that the investments here will not last forever. They'll burn. That new truck you bought, it's going to burn, baby. Someday it's going to burn. Your house, it's not going to be forever. It's going to burn. Somebody could break into your home. By the way, do you have the, one of those apps on your phone? You see if somebody's trying at the door, you know, boom, there it is. Go away. Well, maybe they won't go away. You ever had something stolen? I had a car stolen one time. Right outside my pastor's office door. My little Honda Civic. Call up my wife. Hey, sweetie, did you move my car? <laughs> it's not there. Where are you, honey? I called you at home. That means you're at home. Why would you move my car if you're at home? Someone stole my car. That, things don't last forever. The idea of laying up treasure is the idea of, of taking, I don't know if you've ever seen people who have these coins, they, they just lay up their stash of coins, boom, 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 there it is, or their dollar bills. Maybe it's 100, maybe it's Benji's, you know, boom, 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 boom. Hey, look how many Benji's I got. Wow, I got so many Benji's. How about the guy who built more grain uh, holders so he could put all his grain away, right? 
I got to build more holders so I can put that grain away. And Jesus said, you fool, don't you know tonight you're going to die. And that grain is not going to be of any value to you at all. Don't lay up for yourselves. Don't stack up treasure on earth where moths can consume it, where thieves can steal it. That idea of, of stacking up gold or stacking up silver or stacking up Benjamins. Don't do it. Because earthly fortunes don't last. And then Jesus goes on to tell us how to invest in things that will last forever. By the way, it's not a bad thing to have a nice car. Amen? It's not a bad thing to have a fishing boat, whatever it may be. But if those things consume your life, that's when it becomes what? That's when it becomes evil. Riches are not evil. The Bible never says that money is evil. The Bible does say that money is the root of evil. Why? Because we lust for things that we do not have. And that's really the discernment between need and greed, right? It's, every, it's in all of our hearts. So forever fortunes come to those who see God's plan and invest in it. The big question is, what am I called to invest in? Jesus says we're to invest and really invest in that which will last forever. That's his whole idea. Lay up for yourselves treasures, fortunes in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not bring in and steal. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. My big question is, what is God's plan? Well, I'm going back to something that's very, very redundant, and I hope you don't flip the turn-off switch when I say it, but Jesus gave us a command. He told it to us numerous times. He said, you are to be making disciples who make disciples. And once, I mean, that command is given to me, I hope that's the last call on my breath when I enter into heaven is I want to make disciples who make disciples and that's what God's church is called to do we're not called to mess around with the menial things we're called to in everything and for everything see that people come to faith in Christ that they're built up in him and when they're built up in him they share their faith so they can share their faith with someone else and build someone else up in him Pastor Mike said somebody from Hume Lake met Jesus. Is that right? Somebody met Christ. I'm going to tell you, some of you gave so that kids could go to Hume. And I'll tell you this, you have a part in that investment. And when you see Almighty God, you say, I don't know. If really? Almighty God will have a, he'll, in essence, there's a sense of God has a great ledger. You invest in that which God is is really focused on, God is intent on doing, and we say, God, how can I make that happen? I'll tell you how I make it happen. I invest in it, not only with my life, not only with my time, but also with my treasure. And that's why I give on a regular basis. Every time God gives to me, I give to this local church. Why? Because our heart intent is on making disciples who make disciples. That's why we have missionaries around the world who share the gospel, and we make sure they're not just, you know, drilling wells, which is a good thing. But I'll tell you, that, drill, that well will break down, right? And that water will come to a place where it won't produce good water. But if you share the good news of Christ with those people, you also drill a well for them. They'll not only have fresh water, they'll have living water. That's what we want to be about. So you say, what do I invest in? Invest in those ministries that make disciples, that make disciples. And I'll tell you, that kid who came to know Christ, that's an investment that some of you made and all of us made that will last forever. You say, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I've been a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. How can I invest in something that lasts forever? I'll tell you what, invest in those ministries that make disciples who make disciples. Whew. I'm like the old cow who gave all she got, man. I'm just ready to collect the milk and go home. It's very interesting, though, verse 22 and 23 Jesus adds this verse. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. What is he talking about here? Why does he, why does he add this whole thing about the eye here? Is he talking about what we look at, our television viewing, our, you know, TV wasn't invented yet, but Jesus knew all about it, amen? 
So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of what? Darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What is he, why does he bring this passage in? It's speaking specifically in relationship to the context of giving, of investing in eternal things. Because when he says, the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, he uses the Greek word, well, it's translated from the Aramaic of Jesus into the Greek, hapios, which can be aptly translated or rightly translated as generous. If your eye, say it with me, if your eye is generous, then your whole body will be full of light. God loves a cheerful giver. Why can I give? I give. When I was 15 years old, my pastor back at Palmcroft, he talked about giving. And he said, you can never outgive God. And I chose that day, I'm going to believe what God says. No matter what God gives to me, I'm going to give first. In fact, my dad was always this way. Oh, hey, Jimmy, you made 10 bucks mowing the yard. God, <laughs> part of that's God's, right? Thank you, Dad. And I made that commitment. I'll tell you what, I'm telling you this. God, I have never been able to outgive God. Whose ever phone is ringing, you can answer it. It's okay. I'm not done yet. God's not calling saying, would you please tell him to stop? I know that. I got six more minutes. He's like, I don't know if I want to go for it or not. <laughs> Here's the point. If your eye is generous, your whole body will be full of generosity. If your eye is dark, if your eye is full of bitterness, I'm not, ah, oh, that Jerry, I didn't want to do it. Give. Jesus talked more about money than he talked about anything else. Why? Because where your treasure is there will your heart be also. I think it was Billy Graham who once said, you want to find out the temperature of a man's spirit? Look at his checkbook and see what he's spending his, fun his money on. And I think that's true. Look at the Look at the checkbook. Look at my, we don't use checks that much anymore, but look at your debit account. Go look at it and say, okay, how much of this is spent on investment in eternal things? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Young man was one time, uh, he was asking a young girl to, to marry him, and he says, sweetheart, I love you. She said, I love you too, my guy, I love you too. He says, but I, I don't have the money that Johnny has. I mean, he drives a brand new car, and I just got this old Fiat. She says, I, well, I love you. I love you. It's okay. He says, I don't, have the, I don't have the money that Johnny has. I mean, he has a brand new house, and all I got is this mobile home. And, but I love you, sweetheart. Everything I have is yours. I, I don't have the, the job that Johnny has. I mean, Johnny, he makes six figures, and... I'm just barely putting it out, but I love you. She says, I love you, Johnny. But Excuse me, I love you, Mikey. He says, would, would you please tell me a little bit more about Johnny? Uh, <laughs> if your eye is full of light, your body will be too. Whatever you're looking for right now, the times I'm looking for, transmission for my truck guess what I'm driving down the road every time I see a sign on a truck that says free transmission do you think that gets my attention if I'm looking for a house you guys know what it's like to look for a house you're driving through the neighborhood you see a sign for sale do you see it do you stop why because your eye is focused on that treasure am I right where is your treasure focused on this morning final point that Jesus brings is this. It's that point of following him. I think that really in relationship to food, relationship to funds or our fortune, that Jesus encapsulates everything in this last verse of this passage. And he basically says this. He says, are you going to follow me? 
that means you're going to put me above anyone and everything else. Have you found that to be true? Jesus says this. Look at verse 30, 24. No one can serve two, what? Masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, he will be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, Jesus brings that up because money has, puts a divide between people's hearts and God. It has for, the, for centuries. And I'll tell you this, every single cent that you own has been given to you by God, and it belongs to him. And if you somehow, some way, no, that's mine and that's God's, I'll tell you, everything, my house belongs to him, my family belongs to him, everything I have belongs to him, and he wants to take it, he can take it, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. If it belongs to you, then you've got something to worry about, but if it belongs to him, all he's called us to do is manage it for his glory. That way I can just give it to him. It's yours. Do with it what you wish. What is it that you wish? You can't serve God and money. Some people say, well, I got two jobs. I make it work. No, it's not talking about jobs. It's talking about slavery. Jesus said you cannot be a slave to money or a slave to me. You can either be slave to one. People say, that's really quite uh, sadistic. Where, where does it say in the Bible that we're called to be Jesus' slaves? Right here. The word is doulos, the same word that Cole's last name. The word doulos means slave. Literally, Jesus says you cannot be a slave to new masters. You will either hate one master, you love the other, you will be devoted to the one, you despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Who's the only one who can be our master, ladies and gentlemen? Who's the only one we are enslaved to? In fact, that's what Paul says over and over in the New Testament. He says, I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I am committed to anything and everything to Christ. Everything belongs to him, and I've given him everything, and there's nothing I've withheld held from him. And that's the call to everyone of us here this morning. You say, well, I'm living in a relationship that I know is dishonoring to him. you got a commitment to make. You go to bed at night, you go, I know my life is out of God's will. You've got a commitment to make. If God is calling you to do something with your life or your money or your home or your relationships, and you say, I'm not sure, I've got a divided heart, you've got a decision to make. And I do too. Every single day, I've got a decision to make. And I'll tell you, the choice that I made a long, long time ago, and I have to continue to continue to continue to make that choice every day, and that is this. I choose to follow Christ. Wherever he leads me, I will follow. Whatever he feeds me, I will swallow. He is a good God. He is a good master. I am his slave. And that's the only place of freedom is to enslave yourself to Jesus. So as we close this morning, band comes up. We're going to sing a, a closing song. Really, it's a song of celebration of following the Lord, but I'm going to ask you this question. Is there anything between your soul and the Savior today? You say, I'm living in a relationship that I know is dishonoring to God. you got a decision to make because you cannot serve two masters. You can't serve self and serve the Savior. You say, well, i got an issue with my funds. I know God wants me to do this, but I want to do this. you you got a decision to make. You cannot serve two masters got an issue in your family i'm not sure what our family should do i know this is what i want to do but this is what god wants us to do you cannot serve two masters will you make that decision right now to say i choose to follow christ let's stand as we sing and then we'll close in prayer